Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And again, I just want to thank Heartland for the privilege of being here this week. And I've been blessed just by being here, talking with many of you, getting to know some of you better. And it's a blessing to be among those who are seeking to be preparing for the coming of Jesus, which we hope is very, very soon. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, before we get into the message for this evening, I'm just going to ask the Lord to be with us in a special way. So let's pray as we prepare for this message. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for the blessings that we've received this weekend. Thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath day that we've experienced and for the messages that we've heard. And I pray now that you would pour out your spirit, that you would give me the wisdom to speak what is needed and that the message would be clear. Thank you for this gift of prophecy through the ministry of Ellen White that you've given to us as a people. So bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title for the sermon this evening is The Great Controversy and the Testimony of Jesus. When you look at Revelation chapter 12, we understand very clearly from this chapter that it describes this great controversy, this war that goes on <clears throat> excuse me, between Christ and Satan. We understand very clearly in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And we understand the dragon then, who is Satan, was cast out to this earth. Now, the word war in the Greek is the word polemos, which is a word that refers to being argumentative. So when it says there was war in heaven, this was a war that was basically a big argument in heaven. It was a big fight. Now, it was, just, it was beyond just a few words. This was a war of words that led to a permanent split and to an ongoing controversy that we live with today. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand very clearly this great controversy, which is why we have an understanding for why there is evil in this world, why bad things happen even to those who are seeking to follow the Lord, that as long as we live on this earth, the presence of sin will be apparent and there will be challenges and difficulties because the devil is not going down without a fight. And while God blesses us and God gives us many things that we can be thankful for, the devil will make his presence known at times on this earth. And we as God's people especially can be the target of his attacks. Thankfully, as we all know, God is more powerful than the devil. So we never go around thinking that, oh, wow, when's the devil going to strike next? We know that we are in God's hands. And sometimes God's, God allows the devil to afflict us the way Job was afflicted. But there, there is this war that began in heaven. And yes, Satan was prepared to use force, if necessary, to usurp the authority of God in heaven, but God cast Satan out before he did so. But the war started as a polemical fight, a war of words. And this war centered around Satan's attack against the law of God. Which is why it is very compelling that at the very end of Revelation chapter 12, after we see that there's this war that starts in heaven and it comes to this earth after all the struggles and challenges that have happened, that just before Jesus comes back, we see that God has a people at the end of time who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because in heaven, Satan's main polemical argument against the authority of God centered around 
the law of God. Now, if you think about what Satan was arguing, it's rather crafty what he did. And listen, we can sit here and say, man, Satan's arguments are so ridiculous, and they are. But just remember, one-third of the angels were cast out of heaven with him. And Ellen White tells us in the book Story of Redemption that at one point nearly half of the angels were with Satan. So we are fallen human beings, okay? These were perfect angels who were living in a perfect environment, and they fell for the arguments of Satan. Okay? Let's not think that we're above the deceptions of the devil. We have to stay connected to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus, to the benefits that we receive from the clear Word of Scripture and from the testimony of Jesus. But one of the things that Satan says about the law of God is that God's law is arbitrary. Now, <clears throat> You could look at the law of God, and we could make pretty compelling reasons for why God's law is not arbitrary. We could make some compelling arguments for why it's a really bad thing to kill, and why it's a really bad thing to steal, and how devastating adultery is, and all of those things. And we can say, look, that's not just being arbitrary. That's, you know, obvious cause and effect. But Satan likes to attack at points that he considers to be weaknesses, and they're not really weaknesses. But, you know, in Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I had not known sin, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Now, if you think about it, covetousness is at the root of every other sin. Why do you kill? Why do you steal? Why do you commit adultery? Why do you do all of these other things? Well, it's because you have covetousness in your heart. You desire that which does not belong to you. And what was Lucifer doing in heaven? He was coveting God's position. But here's Lucifer's argument, Satan's argument. He's saying, <clears throat> how convenient is it that the Tenth Commandment says, thou shalt not covet. Uh -huh. Of course God would say you shall not covet, because God is saying you can't have my position and my throne and my authority because God doesn't, God is selfish and he is arbitrary and he doesn't want to give up what belongs to him. So of course he would say that you're breaking my law by saying you shall not covet. And you know what? Nearly half the angels bought that line of reasoning. Now, obviously I don't agree with one bit of it, but I'm just telling you that's what Lucifer was doing in heaven. And so we say, why, why, how did they go for that kind of stuff? Well, here's what Lucifer would do. And maybe you've seen somebody behave in such a manner. You know, the devil will use his tactics through fallen humans. Lucifer would go to an angel who might have a listening ear and say, don't you think it's kind of bad that God says you shall not covet? So like he's basically saying we can't have what he has, which shows that he's being selfish towards us. Isn't that bad? And so the angel would kind of think about that. And then they would go and talk to another angel who would talk to another angel. And then about a hundred angels angels down the line, people would be, or angels would be talking in such a way, and they couldn't trace the source back to Lucifer because he had started this conflagration, and nobody knew where it came from. And then he could come then and say, aha, look at what they're saying, but he was the one who instigated it. You know, I've been around people who will do that. They'll go around and say, don't you think it's bad that the people, the leaders of our church do this and do that? And then they'd come back to the leaders and say, people are really concerned about how you're leading this church. But they were the instigator of the disaffection. So this is what Lucifer is doing in heaven. He creates this war of words. And his war of words is God's law is arbitrary. It's not fair. And it cannot be kept. And he says angels are perfect and by nature don't need a law to govern them. 
Well, obviously they did because once they fell for Lucifer's lies, they became disaffected and eventually were cast out of heaven. So think about this. <clears throat> Lucifer, now Satan's argument is, we were created by a so-called perfect God who made us as so-called perfect angels, and yet he made a law that was so corrupt that it was unfair and arbitrary that we couldn't keep it, and we pointed out the defects in it, and he didn't want to hear from us, so he cast us out of heaven, and so we came down to this earth, and even his perfect humans that he created couldn't keep it, and so, you know, he's saying that his law is perfect, but look how imperfect it really is. That's his argument. And then you come to the prophetic books, and you come to Daniel and Revelation, and you come to this chapter in Revelation chapter 12, and you come to this controversy where there's this great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. This is God's people on earth, and we see that Christ is brought forth of the woman, and then he's caught up to God into his throne, and then there's this war in heaven, and Satan's cast to the earth. And the controversy goes from heaven to earth, and Satan is saying, look at what God did in heaven, and what he did is unfair, and his law is arbitrary and unjust. And then we come down to the very end of time, and there is this woman that God works through on earth. It's his church. It was the Old Testament church before the time of Christ. It's the New Testament apostolic church that then flees into the wilderness. And then at the very end of time, and you know all of this, at the very end of time, we see the remnant of her seed. And this remnant enrages the dragon. You know why the dragon is enraged and full of fury at the remnant? It's because... Here is a people on earth who are keeping the commandments of God, which are the very commandments that Satan in heaven said could not be kept. And for God to have a people on the earth who keep the commandments of God when he claims that these commandments were impossible to keep, completely undermines his entire argument in the great controversy. So guess what? Satan has set all the forces of hell against this end time remnant to try to prove that his argument that he started in heaven is still true. Sometimes we forget what the stakes are in the great controversy. God cannot change his law because he's unchangeable. The law is simply a transcript of who he is. God could no more change the fact that it, the law says thou shalt not covet than that he could change his existence. That's the essence of who he is. But Satan claims that all of this is arbitrary. Now, of course, we understand that when Christ came to this earth, Satan revealed himself to the rest of the universe as a murderer when Christ died on the cross. And so Satan was exposed to the onlooking universe and to the angels in heaven. And there were angels in heaven up until the cross who had questions about some of Satan's arguments, but he, Satan fully unmasked himself when he murdered Christ on the cross, working through fallen humans to accomplish that purpose. Then the angels in heaven saw what Satan's design was all about. Satan's purpose for questioning the law of God really just showed that he was a murderer at heart. But you know, the rest of the universe is convinced, but this earth is not. And when you look at this controversy, and you look at Revelation chapter 12, 17, 
and we know this verse so well, but sometimes we become almost mentally numb to the significance of this verse. This verse is one of the most descriptive and pivotal verses in all of Scripture, hands down. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon, who is Satan, was wroth or enraged with a woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this word war, again, is the word polemos. So, yes, Satan may use physical conflict to inflict damage upon God's people, but guess what? Just as he used polemical arguments to create a fight in heaven, the battle that he is fighting on this earth against the remnant, he uses very similar methods. And these methods are arguments against the two identifying characteristics of of God's last day remnant church who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Because as I said, if there is a people at the end of time who keep the commandments of God, then Satan's arguments are demolished in the great controversy. Now, yes, we know that Jesus came to this earth and lived a perfect life. And yes, we understand that the Bible clearly teaches that he came in the likeness of men, but he was really a man. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh because he came in sinful flesh and he demonstrated that the righteous of the law can be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But what Satan will say is, oh, but yeah, Christ was God. That's his argument. But when God has a people who keep the commandments of God, what's he going to say? Because his argument is, I was a perfect being in a perfect environment, and I couldn't keep the law of God. And God's going to flip the great controversy on its head and say, I'm taking people from the weakest group who's ever lived on the face of the earth. They've lived through all the eras. They have the inherited tendencies from all the way back to creation down to the end of time. And despite their effect, the effect that is upon them, The weakest people who have ever lived, they keep the commandments of God. What do you have to say now, Satan? That's the essence of the great controversy. Don't ever lose sight of that. So Satan creates some arguments against the remnant church. You may have heard these arguments before. But I'll just articulate them for you so that you can understand better just what kind of a battle we're fighting. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, nobody's perfect? Nobody's going to keep the law perfectly until Jesus comes. But then why does the Bible say God's people keep the commandments of God? You may have heard the argument, you know, obedience is legalism. Well, you know, it's true that legalism exists. That's when you try to keep the law of God in your own strength. But a spirit-filled Christian who has surrendered to Jesus... The Bible teaches that God says, I will write my law into your heart and mind. If God writes his law into our hearts and minds, and that's the new covenant, don't you think he's empowering us then to keep the law that he's writing into our heart and mind? When something is written into your heart and mind, this is something that becomes part of you intellectually because it's in your mind. You know what the law is. But it's in your heart, meaning that it's something that's part of you experientially so that it's part and parcel of who you are. It's in your heart and in your mind, God's law, his character is part of who you are. God is saying, I will write my law into your heart and mind. And yet we think we're sophisticated enough to turn that around and say, oh, yeah, but we'll 
still be breaking God's law until Jesus comes? What about the power of God to keep us from falling? So when you hear arguments, and of course, there's the other arguments that the other Christian churches use, like, oh, the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross, and we turn around and say, oh, no, 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 the, the, the law is still here. But then we completely undermine our position as Seventh-day Adventists because we say, well, yeah, we keep the, the commandments of God. We remember the seventh day. And then we say theologically, but we can't really keep the commandments. I mean, like, what kind of an argument is that? Then why would we keep the Sabbath? Why would the Sabbath even matter if we're saying that we really can't keep the Ten Commandments? And so this is all part of the great controversy. You know, Ellen White says in the book Desire of Ages 283, in order for men to keep the Sabbath holy, they must themselves be holy. You know, you can... Keep the rules of the Sabbath from sundown to sundown, and yet your heart can be out in the world. It's like, oh man, well, I guess I'll have to stop my job right now. But then the entire Sabbath, you're strategizing in your mind how you're going to grow your business. You're just not actually doing it. But all Sabbath long, you're thinking about, so I'm going to get this customer, and I'm going to do that promotion, and we're going to grow it in this manner. You know, when I was in medical school, the easy trap for students to fall into will be to talk about, yeah, and this isn't just for medical school, this could be college students. You talk about your classes and what the strategy is to do well in the class. Now, you're not studying, but you're talking about studying. And so technically you're keeping the Sabbath because you didn't study, but on Sabbath you talked about what it's like to study. I, I'm just giving you examples that when you really are connected to the Lord, your Sabbath experience is a reflection of your walk with the Lord all week so that you're connected to him every day. You're living an obedient life by the grace of God through his power. And when the Sabbath comes, you're not like, oh, man, I wish we could be watching the playoffs right now. I wish we could be watching, you know, some political talk show. And, man, we need to be strategizing for the next election to take so-and-so out. I mean, that's not Sabbath keeping. The Sabbath experience is that you walk with Jesus all week and you do the necessary daily life experience of occupying till the Lord comes. But the Sabbath is a holy day set apart for Jesus. And it's a reflection of an obedient life throughout the week. So the dragon targets God's last day people. And he targets obedience. And he makes the claim that God's people at the end of the world can't really keep the commandments of God because angels in heaven couldn't keep the commandments of God and Adam and Eve who were perfect in beings couldn't keep the commandments of God. And there's maybe been a few exceptions from that time till this. Okay, I'll give you Enoch and Elijah and Moses, but Moses, he, he fights even over that. He fought over the resurrection of Moses, as we see in the book of Jude. And Jesus, he's going to discount because he'll say, well, Jesus came from heaven, so that doesn't count. And so he says, there's no way you're going to get a people at the end of time to keep the commandments of God. So that's part of the great controversy. But here's the other thing. Not only do they keep the commandments of God, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this is just as essential to keeping the commandments of God. You're going to have both. God's end-time remnant church will keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, any Christian would say, oh, yes, I'd love to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand very clearly what the testimony of Jesus Christ really is. It's not just the testimony of what Jesus does in our lives. I mean, the Bible makes it very clear. And I talked about this 
last night and in the question and answer session, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but we, and, as, and I'm assuming because, you know, I'm speaking to Adventists, they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy, and as John was bowing down to the angel in Revelation 19, it's the spirit of prophecy, but in Revelation 22, he's bowing down to the angel, and it's the prophetic gift. It's those who are the prophets. So what scripture is saying is that God's last day church, yes, they keep the commandments of God, and they also have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which means that there will be a prophet in their midst who speaks on behalf of, of Jesus and gives his testimony. Now, this is the heart of the battle of the great controversy. Why do you think Satan hates the testimony of Jesus Christ? Because the testimony of Jesus Christ delineates very clearly the character that God's people will have before Jesus comes back. It, there, there's not any question marks. You know, sometimes there, there might be a few areas in the spirit of prophecy where you'll see a statement and then you'll see a, a, a second statement and you try to put the two together. And you're like, you know, if I put both of these statements together, I'm not sure the right way would be. I mean, and I'm not thinking of anything off the top of my head, but there might be a thing out on the periphery here or there that could be that way. But I'll tell you what, when it comes to character preparation for heaven, there's no ambiguity in her writings, okay? There is no ambiguity. When it comes to character preparation, the testimony of Jesus is explicitly clear about the character that God's people will have. You know, we, we know the, the statement very well in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. We know that quote very well. Well, the context of that quote is helpful. You know what that character is? It's just a, a couple of paragraphs earlier. The context of that character is the fruit of the Spirit. And when that fruit is fully ripened, then the harvest will come. And that fruit is very apparent. So Ellen White says this fruit can never perish, will, but will produce a harvest unto eternal life. And then she goes on to say when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced, then he will come to claim them as his own. Well, what's that fruit? It's love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. Now, by the way, it's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a buffet selection. Love, joy, peace. You know, why wouldn't you want to have love, joy, and peace? You know, I've met some Adventists, maybe you have too, maybe someone here tonight is like this, who instead of having love, joy, and peace, have hate, anger, and discord. I mean, <clears throat> is that how you want to be? And what God is saying is that I'm going to have a people at the end of time, who despite all of the surrounding circumstances in this world, will be a transcript of my character. They will keep the commandments of God. They will have no other gods before them. They will not be making graven images. They will not be taking God's name in vain. And that's not just the way we speak. But taking God's name in vain is to profess to be a Christian and to go out and live for the world. And yes, we'll be keeping the Sabbath, we'll be honoring our parents, we won't be killing, or committing adultery, stealing, lying, or coveting. But it goes beyond that, it goes to a character, because God's law is holy and just and good. And that character, which is the character of Christ, is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's the fruit that we need. And what Satan is claiming is, 
you will not have a people who have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And God is saying, yes, I will. So that when you come to Revelation 14, 12, God says, what do you have to say now? Here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, Ellen White has some pretty distinct statements, and I'm sure many of you have heard these statements before. But let me read to you a couple of statements about the type of character that we'll have. In Heavenly Places, page 146 says, Everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. Transgression. Now, that's not ambiguous, in case you wondered. You think Satan likes that? Here he was, a perfect angel, the covering cherub, perfect being in a perfect environment, and he falls and then claims that God's law cannot be kept. And God flips the great controversy on its head. And at the end of the world, when people are living in the most sinful generation that has ever been, he says, look at what my power has done through these sinful people at the end of the world. It's not our power, it's God's power. Now, the problem with some is that we hear this idea and then we go around and say, yeah, I thank God that I'm more holy today than I was yesterday. But you know, Ellen White has a statement for that too. Bible Echo, December 1, 1892. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. Now, some people don't understand how you can have one statement saying that we will reach a condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression, and then yet say the closer we come to Jesus, the more faulty we will appear in our own eyes. Yet if you're connected to the Lord, you'll understand that statement. When you're connected to the Lord, you know that you are sinful. You're never going to go around saying, huh, man, I'm, I'm not bad. I'm, I'm one of the good ones. God, thank you that you've made me a blessing to this church. You know, we don't, that, that's, that's, you know, there's people who are like that. They don't say it, but they act that way. God can't use you if you're like that. All you will do is create a bunch of followers who are as arrogant as you. But when you're really connected to Jesus, you know who you are without Jesus. And character perfection happens without you realizing it. You're connected to Jesus knowing, Lord, I'm sinful. Lord, I'm selfish. Lord, I will lose my temper. I will get cross. I will be impatient. Please, please, I'm hanging on to you. And without realizing that your character is changing and God is giving you grace to deal with situations that you struggled with and you know that you're like all of those things and yet you're changing and so you don't realize so much the change that is happening even though the people around you will notice it. But when, when these things happen, then you don't turn around and say, God, I thank you that I'm not like them. No, you say, God, I thank you that you've saved someone like me. And that's what character perfection looks like. God takes you out of the pit of sin. You don't feel better or holier than anybody else. Because you know who you are. I know who I am without Jesus. And so we have nothing to boast in. And as Ellen White says about justification by faith, it's the laying of the glory of man in the dust. And you know, sometimes the Lord takes us through difficulties and trials and allows the devil to afflict us because he realizes that those trials are necessary so that we'll stop feeling so good about who we are. And we'll realize our complete dependence on him. And so the devil is, en is enraged with this people who keep the commandments of God and who have a gift, this prophetic gift that makes it so clear of the character that we can have before Jesus comes. 
So it's not a surprise that not only is obedience under attack in the Adventist church, you know, many in the church no longer believe that complete obedience is possible. We have this evangelical gospel in the church that teaches that when we give our life to Jesus, our life becomes better. We receive grace and are saved, and our life changes from the past, but we continue to live in sin. As Desmond Ford liked to say, sin will remain but not reign. And yet Ellen White says in the book Steps to Christ that one sin persistently cherished will eventually neutralize all the power of the gospel. So we believe that every sin by the grace of God can be eradicated. And we don't trust in our own strength to eradicate these sins. We trust in the power of God who is all-powerful. And so there's this struggle where Satan is claiming through his power that, no, you can't keep God's law. And yet God is claiming that, yes, I will have a people who are obedient. And so the writings of Ellen White are under attack. So guess what? You know, I mentioned Desmond Ford. Many of you lived through that crisis, and we're still dealing with the fallout even today where his gospel teaches incomplete obedience. And because of Ellen White's writings that make it clear that obedience is possible, he and along with many others say that Ellen White's writings are inspiring but not inspired. Well, that's a nice little catchy phrase. These are such inspiring writings. There's so much good instruction in them, but they're not inspired. So that means that I can pick and choose what I want to believe. <clears throat> and, you know, th these arguments about Ellen White's authority go all the way back to the 1880s at least. I mean, G.I. Butler at the time, who was General Conference president, wrote a series of articles that there were degrees of inspiration in Scripture, and then when she challenged his authority, he questioned her inspiration as well. So we've seen questioning the authority of Ellen White all the way back into the 1880s at least. But you know, now is not the time to be throwing out the spirit of prophecy. I mean, when I look at her writings, and as you heard my testimony this morning, I began reading her writings when I was nine years old, and it's amazing to me everything that she says in her writings are playing out before our very eyes, and I look at a, a world that we live in now, and it's falling apart very, very quickly. And when God has given us such a great gift, the last thing that I would want to be doing would be to throw out the very thing that God has given us to prepare us for the last deceptions. When you look at Revelation 13, which is right after this controversy where Satan is going after God's church, who keep the commandments of God, who have the testimony of Jesus Christ, we see in Revelation chapter 13, Satan's plan to destroy the world. And in that plan... He works through two end-time powers, the first beast which comes up out of the sea, which is the Roman Catholic Church state power, who received the deadly wound in 1798, but then the second beast which comes up out of the earth, having two horns like a lamb, speaking as a dragon, which is Protestant America, and it is Protestant America who forms an image to the beast, which the image being the union of church and state, and then the mark of the beast is the enforcement of Sunday worship. Those two powers unite to cause all the world to receive the mark in their forehead or in their hand. And the only thing that keeps Satan from gaining the control of the whole world is this end time remnant who do not go along with this mark of the beast. If he could just get rid of this remnant he would gain control of the whole world. But the thing that is standing in the way is that there will be a people who will steadfastly stand on the Bible and the Bible only and who will say, we will not go along with this mark. We will not receive it in our forehead. We don't agree to accept this intellectually. And yet there are the others who will go along with it where they receive it in their hand, representing their action. They may not agree with it intellectually, but their actions go along with it anyway. 
But there will be the faithful ones who say, we are going to follow the testimony of Jesus Christ. And so we see in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 48, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Did you hear that? He's going to work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies. So let me tell you something. Yeah, you know what? It's not a big surprise if you go to an institution where they're already teaching evolution in their biology department, if they're going to say bad things about the testimony of Jesus. That, that's kind of a no-brainer. You know that's going to happen. It's not good. I'm not saying no big deal. It's very bad. But you know what? That's not the only place to be looking for that could undermine confidence in the testimony of Jesus. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. You know one of the ways he makes the testimony of Jesus of none effect? By people who come to the church who claim to love the spirit of prophecy and who misuse her writings so that her writings become onerous. Like people don't even want to read her writings because you're misusing her books and what she said so that nobody wants to even hear her words because those who are supposed to be her defenders undermine what she's actually saying so that people won't listen to her. So he works in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. And you know, more than ever right now, we need a people who will be following the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Another statement, letter 40, 1890, there will be a hatred kindled against the testimonies, which is satanic. The workings of Satan will be to unsettle the faith of the churches in them. For this reason, Satan cannot have so clear a track to bring in his deceptions and bind up souls in his delusions if the warnings and reproofs and counsels of the Spirit of God are heeded. You hear that? So if we're following the testimony of Jesus, Satan can't bring in his deceptions. Another statement that you know very well, one thing is certain, those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first give up their faith and the warnings and reproofs contained in the testimonies of God's Spirit. That's Selective Messages, Volume 3, page 84. Now, you look at some of those statements, and I look at what's happening in the world today, and I'm looking at what's happening in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You know, it's rather astonishing that, but I guess we shouldn't be that surprised, because everything that can be shaken will be shaken as we come to the end of the world. But you go to some Seventh-day Adventist institutions and churches, and you have people who are saying, let's make sure we use pronouns so that the LGBT community will feel comfortable in our setting. And it's like, wait a minute, okay? Are we going to stand for what's truth? Or are we going to be influenced by the modern world around us? Now, let me be very clear. We want to show love and compassion to everybody, including people of the LGBT community. We want to show the love of Jesus to them. But the one thing that we don't want to do is to compromise truth in order to reach them. If somebody is a man and they claim to be a woman, I'm going to still show them the love of Jesus. But I can't just say, okay... Your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. Because at the end of the day, the truth is still the truth. Are we going to stand on the word of God, or are we going to let the modern trends redefine who we are as a people? And there are trends that are happening where, you know, we thought it, I thought it was bad growing up when it's like, wow, they're allowing evolution to be taught in some of our schools. And yeah, that's bad. That is. But now we have clubs on campuses that are affirming the LGBT lifestyle. 
And, you know, you, you go to, like, the book of Isaiah, and it says, to the leaders of Israel, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. There was a time when God started referring to the rulers in Israel as people of Sodom and Gomorrah because they had gone so far away from the law of God. And here we are, we are supposed to be God's end time remnant people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And yet there are some in the church who are so confused by what truth is anymore that we don't even know what truth is as Jesus defines it. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And yet where are the people in the church who can identify what truth is anymore? This is all part of the great controversy struggle. The dragon is coming hard after God's end time remnant people. And so those who should be keeping the commandments of God and having the testimony of Jesus Christ are conforming to the world. And I think about ancient Israel and how ancient Israel refused to listen to the prophets. What about God's last day church? Are we receiving the blessing of the testimony of Jesus? Or are we scorning it the way ancient Israel did of old? You know, Selective Messages, Volume 3, page 83 says, Men may get up scheme after scheme. And the enemy will seek to seduce souls from the truth. But all who believe that the Lord has spoken through Sister White and has given her a message will be safe from the many delusions that will come in these last days. Did you hear that? If you want to be safe from the delusions, believe in the prophet that the Lord has given to us. You know, I think of the story of Elijah. Elijah. And Elijah was translated without seeing death. Ellen White was not translated without seeing death. She died over 100 years ago. But she is the prophet that God raised up to prepare a people for translation. And just as Elijah was called upon to speak out against the apostasy and the idolatry that was prevailing in his day, Ellen White fearlessly dealt with issues of apostasy and idolatry and unfaithfulness in her day and time. And those writings are just as relevant today. You know, when Elijah came into Israel and he stood before the king and he said, there will not be dew nor rain these years except according to my word, and he disappeared, he became persona non grata among the people of Israel, and they blamed their problems on him rather than their disobedience. You know how many times I've heard people say, you know, our church would have been so much better off if we hadn't had Ellen White's writings in our church? It's the same thing. Elijah was despised in his day. God's prophet for the last days has been despised as well. And, you know, Elijah had, there's not like this perfect parallel. I'm just thinking of some, some of the stories between Elijah. You know, Elijah goes into hiding for three and a half years, and then he has this Mount Carmel experience, which is a mountaintop experience where he demonstrates through the power of God that God is the God of Israel. And when the fire comes down from heaven after his simple prayer, the, the people of Israel say, the Lord, he is God. You know, God's people are going to have, this is more of an application to God's people than to Ellen White, but we follow the messages of scripture and of the spirit of prophecy. So Elijah has this mountaintop experience. He gives this message that is heard by all the people and fire comes down from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. And then he prays and he prays and he prays until the rain comes and then the rain comes and waters the earth. You know, at the end of time, God's people are going to have this mountaintop experience where we're praying for rain in the time of the latter rain. We see the, the apostasy and the 
the idolatry in the world around us and even in the church. And at some point, God is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And there's going to be this mountaintop experience where the latter rain is poured out. And an angel has come down, is going to come down from heaven, and the earth will be lightened with its glory, and this message will be given mightily with a strong voice. We call this the loud cry, where all the world will hear. Whereas when Elijah gave his message, all of Israel saw it, and they saw the fire come down from heaven. God's people will be spirit-filled, and all the world will hear this message. It will be the loud cry, come out of her, my people. Do you know what happened to Elijah after his mountaintop experience? He fled into the wilderness. And he was fed two meals by an angel. And on the, and on the strength of that food, he fled into the wilderness for 40 days. You know, it's interesting. Elijah fasted for 40 days. Moses fasted for 40 days when he was on Mount Sinai receiving the law, and Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, which is one of the things about the Mount of Transfiguration that is so, tra so fascinating. When Jesus, Moses, and Elijah are standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have from the record of Scripture three human beings who lived on this earth who fasted for 40 days, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. But when Elijah fasted for 40 days, it was different than the other two fasts. His was a fast of discouragement. And he gives this message, and the fire comes down and devours the sacrifice. And he runs in front of Ahab with superhuman strength. And then he gets to Jezreel, and Jezebel sends a message, so do the gods to me, and more also by tomorrow this time, if, if if I don't put you to death, you know what she says. And he flees in discouragement. You know, God's people, they're going to be filled with the latter rain. They're going to give the loud cry. And just as Elijah was threatened with death, God's people are going to face a death decree. And if Elijah, who was a prophet, could become discouraged, you better believe that we could face the same emotions when we go through Jacob's time of trouble. And that's why it's so important for us to be fortifying our minds with Scripture and with the messages from the testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, so when that time comes, we will be prepared for it, and that when the trials of life come now, we will be strengthened through each trial that we go through to be prepared for the final crisis. God has given us this gift. God has given us this message. You know, there's this statement about God's faithfulness to his people. And sometimes we wonder why we're going through these trials. Elijah went through this very difficult time. We often go through difficulties. Notice what Ellen White says in Testimonies, Volume 9, pages 91 and 92. God has often permitted matters to come to a crisis, that his interference might become marked. Then he has made it manifest that there is a God in Israel. Do you believe that there is a God in Israel? You know, the way that God makes manifest that there is still a God in Israel today is that he is demonstrating at the end of the world that he has a people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, and he has a prophet who, as sure as we are here in this room right now, she is the prophet of God for the last days. And that if we believe in her, we will be safe from the many delusions of the last days, and it will prepare us and guide us for the final crisis of this earth's history. Because if we love Jesus and if we follow him, we will listen to his testimony. And so here we are in the year 2023, waiting for Jesus to come. And I believe that Jesus is coming very soon. But you know, he needs a people who will really 
allow him to be the Lord of our lives so that through the grace of Jesus, we live obedient lives so that he really does write his law into our hearts and minds so that someday God will truly have flipped the great controversy on its head so that Satan goes from the perfect being in a perfect environment, taking a third of the angels with him who fell into sin. And God will take a special group of people at the end of the world known as the 144,000 who come from God's last day remnant church. And he will show to the universe what he can do through sinful man so that even though Satan throws everything that he can against God's people at the end of the world, God will demonstrate through his power what he can do through sinful man so that forever throughout eternity we will see an answer to Satan's charges in the great controversy that there was a people on this earth who kept the commandments of God. And friends, God wants you to be among that number. You know, I realize there are some of you in this room that are a little bit older than me, but I'm also not the youngest person in the room either. I've lived long enough to know that this world is an experience of peaks and valleys, of joy and sorrow. You know, how many more valleys of sorrow, sorrow do you need to be convinced that the devil hates you? There are too many people who keep waiting for the next peak to keep going And I'm just like, you know, how many more valleys of sorrow do you need to realize that this world is not our home? Wouldn't it be nice to get off this planet and to live in the heavenly kingdom forever? God is waiting on a people who will be that people who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We are in the crosshairs of the great controversy today. And Satan is targeting us, but remember, God's grace is sufficient. You may wonder why life gets difficult. It's because Satan hates us. But just remember, God loves us, and he's always more powerful. Friends, let's be that people. Amen? I want to challenge you. Let's not go home just checking off another convocation and planning for the next one. I pray that the Spirit will touch our hearts so that someday soon the Holy Spirit will be poured out. You know, I'm done here, but you know, Acts 5 says the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey him. The reason why the latter rain hasn't been poured out is because we're not the people yet who keep the commandments of God. When God has a people who keep the commandments of God, the latter rain will be poured out. And it happens when we let Jesus be fully in charge of us completely. Amen. This time, we're going to have our closing hymn. And so I'm going to invite the song service team to come forward. But as they're coming forward, I want to make an appeal. You've been listening to this message tonight. You're here at Heartland Convocation. And you've heard similar messages many times through the years. But you realize that there's something in your heart or your life right now that's keeping you from being among that number who keep the commandments of God. And you're saying, Lord, I'm gonna, I don't want to go home hanging on to that. And so if that's who you are right now, I invite you to come forward. And as we're going to sing, and you can come forward, and then we're going to have a special prayer at the end of, the, of the, the song. This may not be everyone. I don't expect everyone to come forward, but I guarantee you there's somebody here in this room tonight that needs to come forward to this appeal. Don't let this opportunity go by. You know, 
there's a lot of people in the church who are still bitter towards someone about something that happened 10 years ago. And you need to let that go. And when you come forward, you're saying, you know what, when I go home, I'm going to write that person a letter, I'm going to give them a phone call, and I'm going to make things right. You know why the latter rain hasn't been poured out? Because when we come to church sometimes, we sit in our certain sections because there's some people we don't talk to. And then we think we're going to get the latter rain? And there are so many different things that we may be holding on to, idols, attitudes, emotions, whatever they are. And Jesus is saying, this is the time. This is the moment. Come forward and let's make things right with the Lord and allow him to change us so that we can be that people. Amen. So let's, let's prepare to sing our closing hymn of response. And as we're doing so, I invite you to come forward if that is your desire to have this special experience, to be filled with God's Spirit and to make things right, to be ready for the coming of Jesus. So let's have our our song. I think we're going to sing softly and tenderly. So I'm going to invite the song service team out. And why don't we all stand? And for those of you who feel the spirit moving, I invite you to come forward as we sing this song, hymn number 287 in the hymnal, softly and tenderly.
Amen. Jesus has been tenderly calling us tonight, has he not? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the loving, tender call of Jesus, who never gives up on us. Just as Jesus never gave up on Brother Stephen Smith for 28 years, you haven't given up on us either. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're working on each one of us. And Lord, I pray that someday soon you would be able to say of each one of us, here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. May we have that faith. May we have that obedience by your grace. And I pray, Lord, that this world will end soon so that we can see Jesus come and be with you in heaven throughout eternity. Thank you for this moment in time that we've had as we think upon these things. May we never forget them. May we be faithful to this commitment through your grace so that we can see you in the clouds very soon. Thank you for this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.